Good evening, everyone. My name is Lindsay Hamill, and I'm the Associate Director of Education at UCR Arts. UCR Arts is the California Museum of Photography in the Culver Center of the Arts in um, downtown Riverside, California. And today's third Thursday talk is a conversation with artist Julie Schaefer. Before we begin, um, we at UCR Arts would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Kawia, Gabrielino, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Um, third Thursday talks are supported by the Marjorie and Glenn Memorial Fund. And um, I'm so excited to um, welcome our speaker for tonight's program. Again, it's um, artist Julie Schaefer, and we have um, some of their uh, photographs on view at the California Museum of Photography. And I'm also here with our Director of Collections, Lee Gleason. Um, and so she'll moderate the questions um, later on in the program. So feel free to put any questions you have for Julie in the Q&A box, um, and we'll definitely get to those. Um, so just to introduce Julie, um, they are a conceptual photographer who recontextualizes history through pictures. They have documented the effect of oil pollution on the Louisiana Bayou, the effects of mining on Native American lands, and have retraced the road that Matthew Shepard was taken on after he was abducted and murdered during a hate crime in Wyoming in 1998. In 2005, they received an MFA in visual art from University of, South, of Southern California, and in 2000, they re received a BA in studio art from UC Irvine. Schaefer is a recipient of the 2018 um, COLA um, Fellowship, which includes an exhibition at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery, and they have been invited to create site-specific installations, including an invitation from the National Park Service. Their work has been exhibited in museums, galleries, and project spaces, both nationally and internationally. And Schaefer is an associate professor of art at Chapman University currently. So Julie, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm ready to hear about your work and I know everyone else is, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Lindsay. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here uh, to speak with you all and uh, thank you for showing up on this Thursday um, evening. So I am, um, I mainly wanted to to address and talk about uh, the work that um, is currently at at the CMP um, as part of the analogs um, series, and um, that that body of work is called "Wait Till You See the Devil's Punch Bowl," uh, which was a series of images that I I photographed um, in Louisiana. Uh, but I just wanted to give a little context or a little, you know, contextualize that work uh, by just briefly going into kind of what led into that work. Um, and so what we're looking at here um, is a, um, a shot of me at work um, in the Owens Valley. Um, and uh, what's inside that U-Haul, when I say I'm at work, it's because inside that U-Haul, um, I turned that into a dark room. Um, and I built a pinhole camera and I was photographing different um, lands within California where silver mining occurred um, in the mid to late 1800s. Uh, and I was really interested in seeing, you know, how the, what these lands and what these old mining um, areas look like uh, currently um, and to see if there's any traces that I could see of, of kind of this history that was there. Um, and so uh, I wanted to combine that context with my love of working with analog processes. Um, and I wanted to work in the most tactile, um, slow way possible. And pinhole photography seemed to be the perfect way to do that. Uh, so I, I made this uh, six foot tall camera. It was tall enough for me, or big enough for me to get in and out of. Um, I lined that camera with um, from paper um, and uh, recorded these images of these different mining sites. So all of these sites, there were four in total that I went to um, throughout California, up and down, um, basically the Sierra and Nevada range. 
Um, all of these sites had, had been affected somehow due to this mining, whether the, um, um, you know, there's a toxicity from the arsenic and mercury or, you know, the mining tailings, it's called, uh, that were left behind making the soil, um, you know, pretty much unusable. Um, or this one, which is in Owens Valley, uh, I was, you know, that was taken exactly where that U-Haul was positioned in the middle of a dust storm. So right now I'm in the middle of a lake. Um, it, it's Owens Lake. Um, and it was drained uh, to make way for the LA aqueduct to, and all the water that was supposed to replenish this lake is in the LA aqueduct to help build up uh, the city of Los Angeles. Um, and all of that had to, was connected with the silver mine that was in this area called Cerro Gordo, um, which was the most lucrative mine in the area. All of that money from that mine helped build the Pueblo of Los Angeles. Um, and made it into this, uh, you know, metropolis that it is now. This, this area, the only thing that was missing in LA was water. So all of this water had to be diverted um, from this lake to the LA aqueduct. So what was left behind because this lake was dried out was just all of this, the toxicity that I talked about from um, years and years of mining, you know, it had all settled to the bottom of the lake. Well, now that all this water was gone, all of this toxic dust remains. So these big dust storms, um, sandstorms will go through there and kick up all of this dust. Um, so I was also interested in the peoples that were, um, you know, uh, forced off the land, um, who were eradicated because of this history of mining. Um, and you may have noticed that, you know, that the size of these, the orientation of these images are portrait orientation. Um, each of these are about six feet tall. They're, they're more or less the size of a door or a doorway. And so for me, that, that's a way of implying the body or a body, right? A human body. Um, and when you walk up to these, the, you know, the, the scale, this, this dark black void that's in the sky, you know, it, it points to some sort of like ominous past, something else going on within these images that isn't readily available. Um, and, and part of what's not readily available or that history that I'm interested in is the people that were forced off these lands. So from indigenous communities, uh, Mexican, uh, Chinese um, that were forced to work um, in these mines. Uh, what we're looking at are negatives, so they're each one of a kind, and that's kind of this, you know, this body of work completely shifted the way that I ever thought of making landscapes. Um, and it came about, actually, and let me go back to our sandstorm photo, making this photo in particular. Um, so I'm out there in this dust storm. I have my six foot tall camera. It's loaded with paper and I'm taking, the exposure time is roughly 20 minutes. And as I peeled the tape off the pinhole opening, I could hear all this sand just getting sucked into, um, into the camera and it was hitting the back wall. And I knew it was scratching my paper. And I just, and it had been, the dust had been blowing, the wind had been blowing for several days. And these were like gusts of like 40 to 50 mile per hour winds. Um, and so it just, it was really challenging. And I had reached my limit and I had a full blown meltdown in the middle of the desert. And I was screaming at the wind to just please stop, like for five minutes, just stop blowing. Um, so that I could take a clear picture, because I knew if with all this sand scratching my my uh, my paper, it was going to leave a mark, and with any kind of movement or like dust flowing like this, that it was going to create this fuzziness or this softness, and I didn't want all of that. So I'm scre out there screaming like, just stop, just stop, just stop, and I had this aha moment of like, if I wanted a crisp, clear image of you know 
these landscapes, then why am I out here in a U-Haul with this huge plywood box? You know, like that's not the way to get um, crisp, clear images. Um, and so I started to think about like, well, you know, in a way the land is, is dictating the way that this image is being recorded. And all of these scratches that are on there, um, there's a lot of chemistry stains on here. Like all of that is part of this process. And all of this belongs to uh, wanting to record these spaces and wanting to record the history and what happened to these spaces. And so that radically shifted how I would ever make a landscape again. For me, it was this way of activating this otherwise flat two-dimensional space, right? Because these marks were made by something other than me. Um, that was like lesson number one, that was huge. The second one was that I was completely um, eliminated the possibility of precise framing. Um, and that's, you know, anyone who takes photographs, um, anyone who uses their phone, you know, to take photos of anything, you know that your frame and the edges of your frame are, in my opinion, they are hands down the most powerful tool that you have with a camera. And it's that selection of what goes in the frame and what I'm eliminating. And you can get really, really particular about that. Well, with a pinhole camera, there's no viewfinder and there's no way to know exactly what you're gonna get. Um, and so I really like this idea of, of um, you know, trying to relinquish that control. Um, you know, there's no way to take a purely objective photo, but that was kind of my goal was how can I be as objective as possible and record, uh, let the land make its mark, let the land um, help in the recording of this. And I don't exactly know where my edges are gonna be. Um, so this body of work I worked on for a few years. Um, and after this, I started thinking about, um, you know, well, where do I move from here? Cause this is, has a lot to do with history, a lot to do with California's history. Um, and the history of California and these mines parallels the history of photography. You know, so as all this silver was being found, um, it made the cost of silver go down. It made silver much more readily available. A lot more experimentation happened with photography, um, which allowed it to flourish and, and evolve. Um, and so, you know, I felt like I had, I had tackled that historical sort of reference, you know, pretty thoroughly. Um, and so I was, at home and in Los Angeles, and I was thinking about, well, I wonder what like a modern day kind of gold rush um, or modern day kind of equivalent to this might be. Um, and just from doing a lot of reading and, and research, um, I landed on, on reading about Louisiana and um, how, and this one article in fact was, was uh, titled Modern Day Gold Rush. And it was talking about the oil and gas industries um, in Louisiana and the, the effect that those are having um, on the economy there, uh, but most notably on the land. And so the, this article I was reading talked about how, you know, in a day's time, and you know, this, this kind of was shocking and it's, it's kind of hard to visualize, but in one day's time, about 30 football fields worth of land sinks in, in Louisiana. Every single day, 30 football fields sink. And, and I, you know, so I was thinking about that and I was like, well, I know roughly what a football field looks like and 30 of them, like that seems like a rather large area of land. And every single day that is underwater. Like I just couldn't, quite picture it. Like it seemed like an exaggeration to me. Uh, this article also talked about how um, these oil channels were being dredged through these swamps. Um, and that was, was a, a huge contributor to this, you know, what was sinking. So sea level, sea level rise is one of the contributing factors to all this land sinking. But kind of more importantly were all these oil channels that are, are being dredged through the swamps and through these bayous. Um, what's dredging? Dredging is like a big shovel, if you can think of, just like plowing through this dense, thick, boggy marshland. 
and it just pushes everything, all this land to the side. That's what creates what are known as levees, um, pushes all that land to the side and creates these straight shots so that um, pipeline can be laid down, but also so barges can go in and out to transport you know, the oil and gas. Um, and so from what I was reading this checkerboard, there are these checkerboard patterns of, of these oil channels in Louisiana. And due to this checkerboard pa uh, pattern of all of these uh, dredged channels, um, it was choking off these bayous and these swamplands from the Mississippi um, and from other, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, like sedimentary rock and 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 uh, minerals and other deposits that the Mississippi would naturally leave and sort of dump onto these lands, which helps the trees grow. It's like what feeds everything there. But when you choke that off from these levees being pushed up and like, you know, it can't be replenished, it all starts to just die off. And when it starts to die off, um, that's what causes it to start eroding and sinking. Um, so I thought, well, I don't know, this article seemed like such an exaggeration to me, but also super compelling. And that, you know, it, you wouldn't have to go far into these swamps to find these oil platforms, find these oil channels, and you can see things sinking right before you. And I thought, well, there's no way this is real, but I wanna go and, and find out. And so I went to Louisiana and rented a boat, um, a little tiny fishing boat, you know, it has like a lawnmower engine that you have to, to pull on. And I went out into the fog um, and within a matter of minutes, I found uh, these oil rigs and I found these oil channels. So right here, I'm, I'm sitting in Tex an old Texaco oil channel. Um, this is one of the oil platforms um, where barges would come up and, you know, they'd turn on the valves and, and you know, all the oil or gas, whatever happens to be at this um, particular pump, would go onto these barges. Um, well, a lot of this infrastructure is broken. Um, it's old. It's um, in disrepair. It's cracked. And nobody's responsible for it. Uh, Texaco doesn't even exist anymore. Like these, these companies that put all this in have been bought, sold, sliced up, you know, like, you know, kind of like a big pie chart, like people, other um, interests have come in and, and bought certain parts. And so, you know, the governor of Louisiana at the time said, well, it's really complicated to try to figure out who's responsible. So nobody's responsible. So if you're currently own a big part of Texaco, but you didn't put in any of the infrastructure, you are not responsible for cleaning it up. So all of these old oil platforms just sit there. Um, and so I found them all over. And what I started to notice is like from these cracked pipes, um, you know, it was all this like plant matter that was growing out of it. Um, and, you know, so, it, and it was so, sort of this weird duality of like, you know, the surrounding swamp, which you can see around the edges here is, you know, it's just like brittle and dying and eroding and sinking, but then growing out of these, these pipes was all this like kind of lush, verdant um, plant matter. And, um, you know, so I go back to LA and it just had me thinking like, you know, how do you photograph contamination? How do I photograph uh, the land sinking? Unless it's like through some sort of time lapse, right? Like how do I point to this larger thing happening um, without being really didactic? And um, it started to make me think of like, you know, like ways of seeing photographically that um, the human eye can't see, right? Like ways of seeing recording light with the camera um, that the eye just could never, ever, ever do. Uh, and so uh, I went back with this mission in mind um, of photographing um, with, with my film loaded into the camera in such a way that the only spectrum of light that's recording is the red. Um, with color film, uh, you may or may not, not know there's 
multiple layers of silver that are laid up. There's a red, green, and blue layer. Um, when the three combine, you get this very lush, colorful image that has what appear to be millions of different, of col uh, different colors. Um, well, when you only have the red spectrum coming through, that's like quite literally, you're only seeing red light. Um, so for me, it was just this really kind of obvious way to point to something ominous, to point towards something eerie, uh, something else going on. Um, and, and this is the work that's in the show uh, currently at the CMP. Um, I have four images um, from this body of work and um, I have a lot more to show you here though. Um, and so I focused my attention on the infrastructure that was part of the oil industry um, as well as these landscapes that I saw, I, I made four trips to Louisiana. Um, and over those four trips, I personally saw areas disappear. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought I want to focus in on these, th the infrastructure, as well as these more natural landscapes. I also forgot to, to mention at the beginning, if anyone at any point has any questions, um, please feel free uh, to ask away. Um, I'll keep talking about these, but if there's something you'd like to know, uh, uh, please just either throw it in the chat or, or you can raise your hand. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, one of the things that was really incredible um, about shooting down in this area is I had access to um, uh, these big oil platforms, um, this infrastructure, these oil fields that I would have absolutely never ever had um, in Los Angeles. Like I can't tell you how many times uh, when photographing um, in California that there's, uh, you know, someone's like, what, you know, do you have a permit? Um, like, are you allowed to be here? Like, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to come. Like, you know, there's fences up everywhere. There's somebody preventing you from seeing the thing you want to see. Um, and it's always like liability. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, I'm sorry, you can't photograph it. It's a liability. Um, and so the fact that I was able to literally walk up to these and touch them, photograph them, like wade, I was wading into uh, the swamp here um, to set up my tripod, set up my camera. I mean, I was just like absolutely floored. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I thought I have to take advantage of this kind of access because I don't know when I'll have it again. Um, and so I, I went off every little um, like service road, every little bridge that I saw that could get me closer to um, any of sort of like the, um, the main oil operations along the Gulf Coast. So all of these that you've seen here along the Gulf Coast of, of Louisiana, um, and this is all, I'm calling them kind of mud flats, but it's all just marshy, you know, kind of like swamp water with just like these flat areas of mud. Um, and all of that's been dredged. It was really lush sort of grasslands um, that have just been completely decimated um, in order for the oil operations to be there. Uh, this is land that I uh, personally saw, you know, sink over time. So, you know, they were um, still able to drive on the roads um, if your vehicle's raised up enough. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of what, um, you know, it's like unless I showed over time, it was hard to point to land that just wasn't um, solid anymore. And so a lot of my thinking went into like, the perspective that I wanted to photograph from, uh, the point of view, kind of where I was positioning myself with these so that as a viewer, it'd be, you know, in a sense where you're positioning yourself, you know, and in here we're standing in the middle of this just like swampy land. I can see that there's a question in the chat. I just, 
maybe Lee or someone like, should I wait on the question in the chat or Julie, I'll, I'll jump in and, and read it to you. Um, okay, great. It says uh, it's from someone who remained anonymous. So I don't know who wrote this, but excellent. Okay. Your images are both very political and unsettlingly beautiful. How do you view the balance between those two elements, your ideas versus your photographic eye? That's a great question. Um, I think first and foremost, it's, um, you know, it's like, how do you get anyone, like, you know, part of my thinking is like, well, how do I get people to, or viewers to want to look at this? You know, I'm a visual artist. Um, I make photographs and, you know, I want people to look at them. And uh, when dealing with really you know, politically charged subject matter. Um, you know, a lot of these histories are really dark. Um, you know, they're they're like emotionally dark or psychologically dark. Um, it's it's sort of this balance of like, okay, so how how do you present that subject matter and have people engage with it and look at it? Um, and the way that I have found to do that, um, you know, is in a way through like abstraction and that abstraction is is typically through process it you know so it's sort of like how is this thing made you know like if if people are like well I don't quite like I get it kind of I get what I'm looking at but how did this how is this taken how is this made how is this recorded um and that curiosity for me is like this hook you know, right I'm like I've like anchored into your interest um and then you know, like, and, and usually like how something is made is, is a little bit more, uh, I think, initially kind of accessible or initially sort of like, you know, if something's like really dense subject matter, the how it's made is, is a really good entry point into the work. And so for me, you know, it's, um, I don't know, I've had people tell me before that's really manipulative. And I say, well, tell me something that's not manipulative, you know, like all artwork is, is like wanting to communicate something. And I am wanting to communicate these sort of like these dark histories, um, that exist, um, and reside in the, in this land. And, um, I think photography is one of the most manipulative mediums out, out of all, any of them. Um, and specifically, uh, four by five or what's known as large format photography is hands down the most manipulative. Um, and, you know, so what I mean by that is like, so when you're working with large format photography, you have really big negatives and these negatives hold lots and lots of information. Um, they, the optics of them, uh, like the sharpness of it can sometimes be sharper than the naked eye. So it's sort of verging on the hyper real verging on it right so it's like I see things with the utmost clarity um I I see vast space in front of me I as a viewer you know it's very easy to fall into like I feel like I understand exactly what I'm looking at right with this is like with traditional landscape photography and when I feel like I understand what I'm looking at and I feel like I understand the space I sort of stop wondering about what's beyond the frame or beyond the edges because it feels whole complete um and and you know like all one tight little package and that's where it gets really manipulative because of course a ton of decisions were made um a specific point of view was decided on uh, things were eliminated from the frame uh there's something very specific someone wants you to look at and if I can, if you're lulled into a sense of, of well, but it's whole and complete, um, that's really where like some manipulation can come in. And I think, you know, specifically when talking about the West and the history of the West um, and the history of photography and the way that the West has been photographed, you know, it was meant to manipulate. It was meant to make it seem vast and endless with endless resources. Um, plenty of room for everyone like there's so many natural resources available here from 
you know, the logging industry um, to land and space for ranching, um, gold, silver, oil, you know, it goes on and on and on. Um, well, those things, yes, there, there was a lot of that in the West, but it's not endless. And there's consequences to all of this, like, you know, fervent um, mining of, of the land. Um, so that's a long-winded answer, but I feel like it's a, it's a complicated issue. Um, and I, I was really drawn to, to working with this large format camera specifically for this body of work um, because of its history with, you know, within the history of landscape. Um, you know, like landscapes are often talked about, you know, at, uh, Lindsay mentioned at the start that I, I also teach. I teach at Chapman University. Um, and in classes, quite often uh, landscapes and nature seem to be sort of like intertwined with one another, right? Or that like landscapes are talked about as though they're natural, um, which like the term landscape implies human intervention, right? It implies a frame. It implies edges to something. Nature does not have that. Um, and so I'm really interested in the way the camera has, um, and the, the camera, the photographic frame has added to that history, influenced that history of, of landscape and our human sort of interaction or um, interpretation of them. So there was a follow-up from, I'm assuming the same voice, I'm pretty sure it's our friend Quote Man, um, and he writes, uh, you seem to echo a comment by another political photographer of the West, Richard Mizrach, which is, quote, I've come to believe that beauty can be a very powerful conveyor of difficult ideas. It engages people when they might otherwise look away. Yeah, I, I absolutely uh, echo that. Um, and, you know, I, you know, he, he talks about beauty uh, quite a bit. And, um, uh, you know, I, I brought in abstraction, um, which I think abstraction, you know, there's a lot of beauty in abstraction. And one of the things that makes abstraction really uh, compelling is when you've got like a, an anchor or a foothold in something recognizable. Um, you know, like if it's just, totally confusing and totally abstract that's just a confusing photo and you know as humans we want to be able to categorize and and make sense of things uh, so if your abstraction has this like anchor in in something recognizable then then you've got someone right then you've got them like engaged um so yeah Mizrak is you know and and he's worked extensively um on the louisiana coast and with the oil and gas industries um so yeah he's he's definitely an influence one of the things that's uh was a challenge with uh working this way is that um the um so for any photographers out there anyone who knows what a stop is or like your your f-stops right or exposure times um is that working in this way really affected my exposure times by a few stops so um typically everything would be underexposed which means not enough light to hit the film and you know which would then mean not enough information is there you can't use those negatives so i would have to just sort of on the spot depending on like was it cloudy out? Was it humid? Was it um, uh, super sunny? Uh, just sort of on the fly kind of overcompensate for these exposures, sometimes up to three, four stops. So, uh, you know, working with film is already exciting because you don't know in the moment exactly what you're going to get. Uh, but working in this way was super exciting because I never really knew exactly what was going to record. Trying to find the, uh, oh God, this one. Uh, this, what we're looking at here um, is a dredger. And so, uh, I mean, this, I don't, this thing just looks evil to me. At least it, it looked evil um, in, in daylight. It looks evil here in this black and red image. Um, and those big kind of triangles that are in the middle, those just 
I guess like churn around like that and would like just kind of pull up all of this um you know earth to to be able to shovel it and push it aside uh so one of the other things you know I, i've been talking about the frame and and how much um you know how powerful the the photographic frame really is um and i was just trying to think of like these ways of, of bringing in different perspectives into a singular um you know way of, of setting up a shot um because you could so very easily um i call it so what we have here with the three long poles sticking up that's an oil platform and what that does is that floats out to uh, offshore drilling platforms and those three I call them like a tuning fork like it almost looks like this tuning fork to me um, that would go underneath the oil platform and then that um, you know or the oil rigs that are out in, in the ocean that platform then raises up like that and that's how they replenish um, supplies crew um, food that sort of thing um, to those um, offshore oil rigs that are way out in, in, you know, several miles off the coast. Um, so, you know, it'd be very easy to frame this where I could just crop that out and I just have this like, you know, like, you know, a little bit of land and water and it just looks like something that's a little bit more natural. Um, and so I thought, well, it'd be nice to combine sort of like behind and in front um, or like just off to the side to just show to show just sort of like more of what's around me or more of what's around um, you know the the lens and and this one singular perspective. Julie, another question came in. If you're ready, yeah. Um, uh, they write, thank you for your deep commitments and work, Julie. Repeated visits and slow time in place seem important to your methodology, as does working in series. Can you talk about your time, about time in your practice, not just longer exposures you're, you just mentioned, but also as an engagement with place? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think it's really important I, for me to really absorb a space um, even before I start working on it. Um, so my practice is, is heavily researched, uh, you know, it's a research-based practice and, um, I just, I don't, I like looking at walking through, seeing, uh, feeling, um, you know, a space before I even attempt to record it. And so I always do a, a location scout, um, before I start working. Um, I love talking to people. I love asking questions. I'm a very curious person. I want to know what everything is. I want to know how it works, why it works, like why you do it. You know, I, I just, I'm like a sponge in that way. I just absorb as much of that as possible. And, you know, there's also like, requires a lot of space for stillness also of just like sitting and looking and like smelling, you know, like, what does this place smell like? What does it feel like? What is, what is it like to be here? Um, I tend to do that alone because uh, I don't want distractions while I'm out there. Um, and then I go home and I think about it and I let it percolate and I read more and I think more and I look at a lot of work. I watch film, I watch, you know, I, I, I let sort of inspiration come in from all sorts of angles. Um, and then I know there's just absolutely no way that I could do these, uh, do this work justice by going out one time, snapping a few shots and calling it a day. Like I, I'm not interested in that. And I don't think it, it actually does, serves the work in that way. Um, the pinhole work that I showed you at the start, um, that was something that I had wanted to do for 13 years. Um, and so it took 13 years to start working on that. And I'm really glad it did, uh, because I had the idea in undergrad that I wanted to work with large pinhole cameras, but I didn't have the idea yet. And so, you know, I just, I let things just like sit and percolate and, um, 
you know, while I'm out here, I start getting ideas for projects to work on next. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I feel like it, it's like the best way to really, as much as I can try to absorb a space. Cause you're like, I'm not from here. I'm not from Louisiana. I don't really know what it's like. I, I have no idea what it's like to live there. Um, so it's the best I can do as far as like trying to absorb this space. Um, and just, you know, I'm also talking about change in the way that the land has been altered. Um, you can't see that in one, one visit or one trip. You know, it really requires multiple visits and, you know, a length of time or like this expanse between visits um, to really start to see some sort of change. So I hope that answers your question, but thank you for that. Uh, this, the, um, you know, this is one of those, uh, another one of those images of wanting to bring in multiple perspectives um, into one frame. And what we see on the right side um, is a road out to um, an area called the Ile de Jean Charles. And um, that road has been uh, completely submerged multiple times, just about any time there's a hurricane or heavy storm that road is underwater and the whole community that's out at in on the um it's the island of john charles but the french the ile de jean charles uh, that whole community then is stranded um at least by car you know just about everyone that i saw in these you know uh along the gulf or living along the water here ha have a boat as well but you know as far as they're stranded as far as the cars are concerned getting out of there. Okay, I'm very conscious of the time here. Uh, I just uh, wanted to just briefly just show, uh, you know, there was two methods that I had for uh, making this work. You know, so, you know, talked extensively about this, but um, one of the first questions I had asked myself or I, I sort of brought up after that first visit to Louisiana is how do I record uh, contamination. Like, how do you make it, you know, unless it's like neon green, right? Or like some sort of like fuchsia, like how do you make it obvious that something is contaminated or something's not right? And so I thought, well, I can't really take photos of contaminated water. Um, it, I, I don't even know if, if anything would show, like, how would you know? Right. And so, um, I was instead interested in like, well, what if the contamination itself uh, made the work. And so um, I also made a series of lumen prints, which is what these are. So lumen prints are very long exposures. By very long, I mean several hours. Um, and this is black and white photo paper that you use in the darkroom. Uh, but when you leave that paper out under UV light for long enough, it actually starts to turn color. And that color is based on a chemical reaction between the silver and the paper, um, you know, the sun, the humidity, the cloud coverage, the temperature, and like whatever is sitting on top of the paper. Uh, so I would anchor uh, the paper um, underneath any sort of the plant matter that was growing out of these oil platforms. Um, so I never really knew what I was going to get. Um, I didn't know why certain colors came. Um, each sheet of paper that you use, the, the stock of paper, how old it is, if it's warm tone, cool tone, you like all of, there's so many variables of, involved here um, that it's just sort of like, you get what you get. And um, I really enjoyed working this way because I mean, the, the, the other thing that was kind of incredible, so when you work with these, um, the only chemistry you, you use is fix um, in the darkroom to make the, the image permanent. And the way that the image looked before it was fixed changed, it changes instantly. Uh, so the colors are so much different than when you put it in the fix. Then when you're done with the fix, um, the prints almost look kind of, the pale yellow with a little bit of imprinting on it. And then when they dry, things like this happen. So 
I get, there's just kind of all this, like, you know, like the magic that we talk about in the dark room, it's just like accentuated with this process. Cause you really don't, it's really hard to anticipate what this is going to look like. Um, so I, I love working with photography in a way where um, working with, you know, things that are one of a kind, cannot ever reproduce this. Um, you know, it's a series of singular photographs, which, you know, photography is all about being able to make endless copies. Um, and the only thing that differentiates these is, um, you know, the paper size. So I worked eight by 10, 11, 14, um, up to 2024. 20, so the scale is, is just dependent on the size of the paper that I used. Um, so yeah, so that, this is, uh, what I have to show for, um, uh, wait till you see the devil's punch bowl. So, um, I can stop my share if that works. Yeah. Julie, could you, um, speak to the title, um, and what that means? Uh, wait till you see the devil's punch bowl. Yes. Uh, so, uh, that title came about uh, because of a conversation that I was having with a gentleman that worked on one of those oil platforms, the things that I called looked like a tuning fork, uh, where he, uh, you know, he was just curious about what I was doing and, and we struck up a conversation and, you know, I, I was asking him all about, you know, like how deep do those oil platforms drill and like the offshore drilling, like how extent extensive is it blah 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 and uh and so he was saying he was talking about the um oh god why am I... the big oil spill in louisiana in 2005 why am i blanking on it oh yeah but um shell no it wasn't shell that one was bp it was yeah. bp yeah oil spill. <laughs> yes uh so he said, um, you know, he said, oh, I, I was here for that. And he was talking about just how much that just kind of wrecked the ecology of the area. And I said, oh my God, that must have been so intense. And I said, um, you know, are, are you afraid something like that might happen again? And then he was just like, he started laughing and he's like, it's not if it might happen again, it's when it's going to happen again. And he said, um, we're currently drilling in one right now that's so big, so deep that we don't even talk about it. And like the pressure is so intense. Um, it's just a matter of time before there's a, a spill. And he said, we call it the devil's punch bowl. And, and I was just like, why isn't anyone talking about this? Like what, and you know, and his answer is basically like, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And then he just started laughing and, and he, he's the one who said, wait till you see the devil's punch bowl. Um, and I just, I, I you know, it just, it seemed perfect. That's perfect. Wow. Thank you. So another sure. question came in in the Q and A um, from my colleague uh, Douglas McCullough, and he wrote, uh, "You're a <laughs> you're a marvelous transcriber of spaces of destruction and ruin, but does doing so affect your psyche?" Uh, good question. Great question. Uh, yes, it does. It does. Part of the um, advantage to working in a sort of slow methodical way and revisiting a space over time you know with uh you know with a lapse in between is you know part of that is is me recovering from it quite you know and like and with a lot of this work um you know i didn't have funding for it so it was like the time in between was, was you know i'd squirrel away money cobble together sick days and then go out and work for like a week, 10 days. Um, and then it might be six, seven, eight months, a year before I'm back out and able to shoot again, you know, for those reasons. Um, but yeah, the psyche was, it, it needed to heal. You know, I, it, it being me needed to heal from that. Um, yeah, you, I go into some pretty dark 
spaces by by being out there. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that question, Douglas. Yeah, well, thank you for putting yourself through that because the, the work is so powerful and amazing. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I'm gonna throw one at you, uh, but please, I wanna encourage our audience if they're thinking about anything to throw it in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, you know, as, as you know, Julie, the, the analog space is meant to riff on the permanent collection uh, exhibition that we have adjacent to that, that room that the analogs is in. Um, and so you had come to mind because this is a field camera show and so much of your work has been about large format photography, going out and trekking too hard to get to places and using, you know, these more difficult equipment than one could use. Um, so I wondered, could you talk about um, the choices you're making, and I know this is a nerdy tech question, but can you talk about the choices you're making in technology and how, I mean, to me, it seems so intrinsic to your work, but how it relates and, and how, how much that, that is necessary in, in your output. Yeah, I, um, so I sort of, uh, you know, approach the the camera so the camera is a recording device and uh, whether it is analog or digital it records light in a specific way that that I'd like it to right or photographic paper if we if we want to go cameraless right it record it will absorb light and and react uh, so I think I I so I don't have like a hierarchy of like you know analog over or digital, I just tend to gravitate more towards analog. I, I think it allows me to record in ways that that line up with with my ideas. Um, I just I, I absolutely I when I do frame with a camera, Lee, I am so precise with like I it used to take me weeks to get through a 36 exposure roll of 35 millimeter. Because like I would take one shot and I was done. I didn't need to take different angles, multiple angles, um, and so working in a a slower way with a four by five, it just it it suits my 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 way of of making work anyway. Um, and as far as like um, for me, like I was talking about with the Devil's Punch Bowl, the uh, I was interested with four by five just because of its history of large format photography and landscape and the, and the way that those two things are, are um, like intrinsically sort of tied together. Um, so that's really my interest in with, with large format. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, there's a new question in the Q&A, um, and I was actually thinking of throwing this question out next. Oh, there's two questions. Um, so there's one that's perfect as a last question. So we'll go with um, this, this other question first that just came in. Um, can you talk about scale in your approach to printing and presenting? Yeah, I, so I, I tend to work rather large, right? Like, so those pinholes were like six feet by 40 inches. And then I thought I'm gonna go smaller and smaller and smaller, but like 2024 20, is as small as I've gotten. Um, I do think that like, it's such an important question and it's, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule for it. Um, landscapes, and I think specifically landscape shot with large for, format cameras tend to be printed so mega large. Um, and at least for me, you know, I, I sort of love standing in front of, like, when I say mega large, I'm talking like six feet by like four feet, you know, like just massive, but there's a detachment you can have from that, right? Cause I can stand back and look at it. Um, and I'm really interested in like activating that space between like, here's the image on the wall, here's the viewer, that space in between, how can I try to um, activate that space more. Working a little smaller requires someone to come in. And when you have tons of detail kind of packed into something that's a little bit smaller, it just, it requires more looking, right? And more um, just sort of like sitting with a piece. Um, and so that's the way I've been thinking about it lately, um, you know, is, is ways that I can like kind of pack lots of information into a frame um, and have it large enough we can see those details, but small enough you got to pull someone in to, to really look at it. Um, 
And one day maybe I'll be GD Fiskin size of like, you know, like contact prints. But um, yeah, I, I would say um, another thing with scale, and this is a, a, you know, advice that was given to me, and I think it's really helpful is if you have access to a projector, if you project an image on a wall and just like, you know, like mark out, you know, sort of the framing of it and just see what that looks like from, you know, a 30 by 40 to smaller, smaller, smaller. Um, that really is super helpful, actually. Oh, that's awesome. So I think uh, pretty much we just have one last question and it was what I was going to ask is the last question, but I like this phrasing better, which is what project or topics are you pondering up for next? Uh, well, oh, so there's two. There's one I've been working on for a while called Parting of the Ways, which was, is shot along the Oregon Trail. Um, it's these rubbing or not rubbings, carvings that um, emigrants who took the Overland Trail to, to travel west um, carved into these hillsides and they carved right over um, Native American petroglyphs. So it's like this literal erasure of the history. So I've been photographing uh, those names. Um, and what I'm in the uh, production stages of now are there are a few mine shafts that I am turning into camera obscuras and photographing within the mine shaft so that what's recorded is what, you know, it's a bit of the mine shaft itself and then whatever's right on the outside of it. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be quite, a, it, there's a lot involved, but I'm, hey, I'm down. I'm down for it. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to starting to work on that one. That's, that's awesome. And is that in California or Nevada? Or uh, yeah, I mean, I, so far the, uh, they're in the Mojave, a, a few of the, of the mine shafts and tunnels that I found. Um, so I'll start there and then we'll see where it takes me, but um, I'm looking forward to it. There's a, um, <laughs> we got, I, I think this is, is Douglas at work again? Uh, he says, then you can start tunneling your own mine shafts. <laughs> right, I'll be out there like with a pickaxe, just like <laughs> making my. You gotta own. get that perfect, you know, that's, that's the right. outside that's view right. so you make the inside hole for yourself. <laughs> Bring some dynamite. Um, <laughs> All right, well, it's it's seven o'clock, so I'm gonna hand back to Lindsay. Yes, thank you so much, Julie. It's it's been great to hear about your work and really looking forward to um, seeing the next iterations. Um, and I uh, just wanted to encourage everyone here to come to UCR Arts to see your exhibition in person. It's on view until September 18th. Um, and then also the um, exhibition that Lee mentioned, the breadth of field, um, field cameras um, exhibition will be up through um, Jill, January. Through, yeah, the end of yeah. the year. Yeah, so um, thank you again, Julie. It's been um, Thank amazing. you. And um, I hope everyone has a good evening. <laughs>